You're listening to the Nerd to Know Media Network. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. Welcome to episode 10 of The Game Corner. My name is Kino Calcon, as always, and we have a very special guest with us today, one of our nerd-to-know media friends who you've probably come across if you have checked out her awesome Straight Outta Canto show or indeed our nerd-to-know media podcasts. It's Lisa Harris from Straight Outta Canto. Lisa, how are you doing? Hi, Kian from The Game Corner. Hello. <laughs> how are you doing today, today Lisa? I'm grand. I'm hanging in there. Life, as we know, it is very slowly returning to normal, <laughs> if it ever was. And tell me, how? what are your kind of feelings on that? Because when I started the show, we were very much in the middle of the lockdown. And now, as things start returning to normal, are you looking forward to getting back out in the world? Or would you like some more hiding in the cave time? It's a double-edged sword because part of me is like, I need to return to, I need to see people. I need to go out and do other things. But then part of me is like, I feel like Homer hiding underneath the pile of coats when he's about to take that big university exam. And I'm like, no, no, I just want to keep hiding under a pile of coats and keep playing video games and literally eating pizza literally every single night. I don't want to have to return to the real world with responsibilities. (laughs) Yeah, I've had a lot more pizza since this whole thing started. Oh, it's like the one thing that's kept everyone alive, I think. <laughs> Short, greatly shortened our future lives, but, you know, for now, it's been my main sustenance. And tell me something. You've been a lot busier with uh, your own podcast, which I know you were incredibly busy with even before the world stopped mm. moving. What have you been doing to kind of keep yourself occupied over the last two or three months? I literally, the only thing that has actually kept me sane is like my hour of Nintendo before bed. (laughs) Literally. The only thing. It's like, it's like the nice transition between, because you know with the lockdown, the way the day is just so long. Mm. And it doesn't end. And there's like no gaps. Because before, you know, you'd get up, you'd go to work, you'd come home, you'd have dinner, you'd have your little compartmented, kind of segmented parts of your life. And it's like now with lockdown, it's just like one endless day that rolls into the next so my hour or two in nintendo before bed is literally like right switch off play this <laughs> this is the end of one day we prepare for the next okay well that's a segue if ever i heard it what games are you playing at the moment okay well actually very fortunately just literally as the lockdown began on march 6th uh, pokemon mystery dungeon rescue team dx came out which was i remember you getting fortunate. very excited for this very early on in your kanto yeah. podcast so tell me does it live up to the hype yes i know well kind of yeah it does so basically pokemon mystery dungeon rescue team dx is a remake of the original game boy advance pokemon mystery dungeon game which was kind of unique because with the pokemon games you're a human and then you own pokemon and catch them and battle them and trade them and all that like kind of like a glorified human human pet Mm. relationship but with pokemon mystery dungeon dx you actually get to be a pokemon and you get to interact with pokemon as your peers and your allies and your foes and you get to battle as a pokemon so that's what's unique about that and it's interesting to see it updated for the switch and they it was kind of disappointing because it was a copy paste of the original game just with better graphics because obviously the switch has a fantastic capacity for the sound and the graphics Mm -hmm. and all that but it was really good but it felt like one really long mini game Okay, well, this is actually, I want to ask a broader question, because I must confess, I've only kind of played the main kind of story Pokemon games, Mm. like your reds, your golds, your pearls, that kind of stuff. What's Mm. the kind of hook of Mystery Dungeon compared to that type of Pokemon game? Well, you get to be the Pokemon. So the whole point of all the Mystery Dungeon games is you are a human, but one day you wake up and suddenly you're a Pokemon. 
and right. you come to this mysterious land, woken up in a strange land where kind of the humans are Pokemons. And you're in, you usually get like this sad little kind of a mill house of a friend who like is like finds you abandoned by the beach or by in a field like, hey, wake up, buddy, are you OK? And then you wake up and they're like, oh, hello, fellow Pokemon. I was so worried about you. So it's kind of a weird one. You get to be the Pokemon and it's cool. And instead of having a kind of a linear RPG format, you, there is a plot and a storyline and you advance. And some of them are quite dark. I find that uh, the, the Mystery Dungeon games tend to be a bit more plot heavy and a bit more intense than some of the um, main games, which is cool. But uh, it's deadly though, because you get to go on all these adventures and you get to physically attack other Pokemon as a Pokemon and stuff like that. And you get to like, and, and it's interesting as well because in Pokemon or any RPG, the layout of the floor plan of the game is the same. And if you can't uh, advance through a level, you go back to the start and keep trying. Whereas with Mystery Dungeons, the game, like the layout of the game changes every time you go into a dungeon. So it's really head wrecky if you're trying to defeat a level or if you keep getting knocked out at a certain point because there's no guarantee you're going to, you can't just kind of build up a speed run and learn the layout of the plan of the game because it changes like every time you play it. Okay. And like, um, obviously without the kind of tournaments and that kind of stuff, a lot of the, like you kind of already said, the hallmarks of the game kind of aren't there so like, no. what's your kind of story goal in terms of it like you're, are you just trying to simply get through it you mentioned there's kind of darker themes to it like hmm. yeah so like obviously like you know from playing your gold and silver and your red and blue you know you're a young kid in a small town you, you get your eight badges then you defeat the pokemon league then you become the champion and then literally nothing happens to you and you just get overweight and old and depressed and have bad fan fiction written about you where you <laughs> just like think like Pikachu and stuff but um no with Pokemon Mystery Dungeon with every Mystery Dungeon game you wake up as a human for an uh and, and there's an apocalyptic storyline you wake up as a as a Pokemon I mean and you have to find out why you've turned into a Pokemon and the reason is always in all the games is you've woken up in the world of the Pokemon as a Pokemon because you're going to have to save the world for some reason. There's usually some tragic backstory to your own story. There's usually a tragic backstory to why there's an apocalypse and you have to solve the apocalypse and solve the mystery of the apocalypse and save the day. That is literally the, that's literally your role in every Pokemon Mystery Dungeon game to stop the end of the world for some reason. Okay, and you said this is kind of a remake, so... What are kind of the new features that have been brought to this one? Well, it's more player friendly because in the olden days um, on the Game Boy Advance and even the <laughs> Nintendo DS, the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games, like you could only really play them if you had absolutely no responsibilities, no social media, no social life. The grind was real. It'd be the equivalent of playing one of the new Pokemon RPGs compared to, say, Red and Blue, trying to grind through the Elite Four it impossible like the grind in the older games was awful especially like i remember one entire summer i think it was after i'd done the leaving search or before i'd done the leaving search or something like that and i spent four months with nothing to do but literally just grind through temporal tower in pokemon mystery dungeon explorers of a time of darkness because there was nothing else to do so they've made a lot of the functions like it's easier to level up it's easier to get through levels there's it's just a bit more user friendly even though they haven't adapted uh, the story any further than what it was originally but it's still but the thing is with the pokemon mystery dungeon games there's always such heart and they always go right for the feels like right for the feels like the pokemon mystery dungeon explorers of time and darkness games uh for nintendo ds they are actually one of the most poignant and heartbreaking <laughs> like additions to the pokemon franchise like and that's universally accepted kind of by most fans and can i ask then if for example, there was someone out there, there may be someone out there who either hadn't played the Pokemon game in a long while or just isn't into the franchise. Is there enough in this game to draw them in and hook them? Maybe. Like, it does help. See, with a game like this, um, it, it helps if you're coming at it from a nostalgia point of view because uh, one of Pokemon's main problems with the Switch is none of the Switch games are that good. They're very shallow and it feels like you're kind of playing a real kind of a house of cards kind of facade of a game. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of complaints about, um, you know, there'd be more content, a lot more in it for in, in the Nintendo DS or the Game Boy Advance games and stuff like that. 
which would have a lower capacity than the Switch. So I don't know whether I just really enjoy this for the nostalgia factor or whether it's actually a good game on its own because it's just, it, it felt very comfortable. I don't think there would be enough in it, maybe. It's enjoyable, but I don't know whether, like, if you're not a fan of Pokemon, then I don't know how appealing the novelty of being a Pokemon would be. You get me? And yeah. Playing as a Pokemon. So I think there is the nostalgia factor. Although, like, it is a good, like, if you treat it as just like a fun mini game filled with lots of fun mini games, it is enjoyable, but. I, I can't really see someone who isn't like really into Pokemon kind of having the patience for it or just having the interest engaged for that long. Well, Even that though I a... did really enjoy it. Uh, sorry to cut across you there. That is a fair point in and of itself because uh, Kev, who's also on our channel, um, he said something lovely about the Switch, which is that uh, it is the most comfortable console to play on. Mm. So in that mm. respect, it might be a game that lends itself nice, neatly to the Switch console. like. Yeah, yeah. No, it actually transfers really well. Um, it do, like the funk, like I said, the Switch is a fantastic console. It's just so sad that Pokemon hasn't stepped up to the plate with regards to the games it's making for the Switch. Mm. But um, it is it like every, the game, like I said, the functions of the game and the functionality and the features in the game do lend themselves beautifully to the Switch, and everything's very smooth and seamless. And it you can just kind of lie there for hours, just completely like it's really addictive. Um just whether the addiction lasts that long, do you know what I mean, in terms of um, playability, because I kind of stopped playing after about a month, once I was about, I'd done the main game, and I'd done, like, maybe a quarter of the post game, and there's still a load left, but I'm kind of bored of it now, and I don't want, I kind of don't feel the need to carry on. I might okay. one day. But, so there's limited know, replay value in that respect? It, yes and no, because the thing is, there's so much left for me to do in the game, but it's I identical gameplay because you go through this big long grindy dungeon for 99 levels then get a, like a mythical pokemon at the end and i'm like i've already done that a lot for the main game and for the main post game story so i don't feel i need to do that just to tick boxes because i know some people are like die hard and like pokedex collectors and they need all the pokemon and they need to tick every box of the story i'm very much like a gamer for just the enjoyment of it and i feel like there'd be no benefit to me going into the like <laughs> wish cave for 99 levels to get a Celebi because it's really funny because um, get the Celebi in wish cave is one of the most legendarily notoriously hard things to do with Pokemon mystery dungeon and like four hours of misery is what someone online referred to it as and they were not wrong. Okay well because <laughs> this is a weird show being recorded to um this will go out in two weeks' time, but we're talking about the future from our point of view. I believe you also mentioned off the air Short Sword and Shield DLC. That's coming Ooh, out soon, yes. yeah? It is. It's coming out tomorrow. I've been having internet trouble, so I haven't been able to pre-download the content that will update itself automatically tomorrow. Hmm. But this is a bit of a bone of contention because never before has Pokemon ever had anything locked behind a paywall. And okay. I don't know about you if you've ever had any experience with um, paywall locked games or anything like that. It's my first kind of experience with it. But um, I run the Pokemon Fan Club Ireland Facebook group. And in the last kind of year, people have really turned against Game Freak. They've really turned against Pokemon because of things like this. Because when Pokemon Sword and Shield came out, it's like it feels like such a half assed game. Mm. Like I enjoyed it but it wasn't very good. There wasn't a lot in it. It didn't feel very full or rich. And it was specifically deliberately missing half its content so that it could be released now and you pay an extra 30, 60 quid for it. So that's a contentious one. I will download, well, internet pending, I will be downloading the uh, <laughs> second half of it. Um, it's a, uh, it's, it's it's actually, and it's even weird because it's not even like you're getting the second half of it now. You're getting the first half, the second half now. The um, Isle of Armor Island will be unlocked, and you can do all the different trials and tribulations and quests on that. And then at some point in November, there'll be the Crown Tundra expansion pass released. So it's like, here's a game. You'll get it in three installments, basically, which I think <laughs> is awful. And and no one's really clear whether the downloadable content you buy now will update automatically to include the second half of the second half of the game so i don't know whether i'm going to be paying 
two more times for a game I paid 60 euro for in November. <laughs> I see what you mean, because my experience of Pokemon is that whenever I bought a game, be it back in the 90s or even on the DS kind of more recently, like I always knew I was buying months worth of content. It, even if it was a exactly. remake, it was an investment. So yeah, are you kind of suggesting word. that parts of the game were deliberately withheld, but they sort of put a full price sticker on it anyway? Is that what you're kind of getting at? Well, that's that's the fact. Um, because we all paid like I I actually I bought Sword and Shield because I'm a collector. I have to have both mm. versions of the game. So I paid 120 euro in November for two half finished games, and they were del- now. There's kind of rumors because some people are like, okay, there was an accident or something. There was some sort of problem with Game Freak last year when they were making the games, and they had to excuse me, they had to start from scratch, and that kind of but then they hid it from the players and that was the whole kind of hashtag game freak lied mm. uh kind of campaign that was going on so some people are like oh they're oh, they're only they're they're going they're only releasing half the game cuz they only have half the game done now and then when they have the other half of the game they'll release that and then when they have the other half of the other half of the game they'll release that then but then there's just you see cuz there's been no open transparency about the fact that there's going to be DLC two DLCs for both versions of the game so mm. There's just been no transparency about it. We all paid 60 euro for a full, which is a full price game, but now we have to pay an extra 30 euro on top of that, I think, for each expansion pass or for at least each sword or shield. But then some people are like, okay, well, look, think about it. You would pay 60 euro for, say, Diamond and Pearl, but then you would pay an extra 60 euro a couple of years later for Platinum, which is the same version of the game, expanded. So there's kind of arguments then saying, well, look, maybe it's just because this is coming out so soon after uh, the original release of Sword and Shield in November that people are complaining. Maybe if this was released a couple of years later, people would be delighted thinking, oh, this is our, because you know the way there'd be red, blue, then yellow, diamond, pearl, then platinum, you know, ruby, sapphire, then emerald. So people are like, okay, well, maybe this is just the future and maybe the DLC just makes more sense uh, from a kind of a production point of view, because why bother releasing boxes of games with the extra content on it when people can just go to the store for half the price by the download of it and it'll update automatically so maybe they're just going with the times maybe this is just the future of gaming but then there are a lot of people who are very annoyed that it's locked behind a paywall and they think this just kind of signals the end for pokemon the franchise as we know it and 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 unfortunately in on both the straight out of canto facebook page and the pokemon fan club ireland facebook group we had many heated discussions since November about this, and a lot of people have just Pokemon has lost a lot of fans because of the paywall thing, and 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 it's it's a weird one as well because um I don't know if you'd remember uh, ever trading Pokemon with other people at school or in in your peer group. Oh yeah, I had I had my Game Boy and my trade cable and everything. I remember that. Yeah. And and did you ever battle anyone else just through say the infrared or the Wi-Fi or something like that? Yeah, well, I never got the infrared to work, but I definitely did the battling, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So in the olden days, the whole point of Pokemon is you're to collect and trade and battle with other people. But now I only found this out because I'm I'm not like a big gamer gamer. I like, I love my Pokemon and I love a few other kind of bits and pieces. But, you know, I wouldn't be like one of those hardcore gamers who'd be there hooked up to all these different consoles and have all these different accounts and know absolutely everything. So I, with the Pokemon Fan Club Ireland recently, I was trying to run at the start of a lock of the lockdown um, a Pokemon tournament where everybody kind of hooks up to the internet the magical mysterious ether in the cloud and like battles each other from afar like we had people in Cork Kilkenny Dublin Galway up north and stuff and we were all gonna have a big tournament and even though I was the one organizing it I only found out on the night that I couldn't actually participate in my own tournament because if you want to now battle other trainers with your Nintendo with Pokemon, which is the sole purpose of the entire game, and in the 20 plus years uh, you've been able to do that, if you want to do that, you now have to pay to battle other people by what? signing up to like a Nintendo. Yep, yeah. you have to like sign up for an annual um, membership for Nintendo. Like it's only 20 euro that's or dollars a so year. So that's completely ridiculous. Like, can you at least like battle if, like, say you're in the same room with them or something like that? Sure. No. That's. Okay, yeah. I know, do you know what I that mean? That seems a bit scabby, yeah. 
yeah and and the thing is like like it's see i know some people are really into the community gaming and stuff like like for me it's it's totally a mental health thing mm. i just use it to unwind myself and i play, like i said i play through for enjoyment and for the fun factor and i'm all about the story i'm not one of those like statistic based person or the battling IV training i just love big fat pink jigglypuffs and big fat purple <laughs> gengars and i love a good story and then i love chatting about it with people you know but there'd be like hardcore gamers in the group who'd be like, you know, battling with people every day online. And they were like, yeah, did you not know? You like need to pay now if you want to use the basic core function of Pokemon. And I'm like, oh. Oh, which is bad. Cause like, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the Pokemon Go on the phone and they let you do everything on that game for free. And it's a free game. Like, it's mad, so isn't it? it seems. Yeah, and I suppose the word you kept using before we got into the very controversial stuff there was maybe this, maybe that. So, I mean, you made a fair point with, like, you know, red and blue and then breeze yellow, but you never mm. felt like things were being inhibited from you. Yeah. When you played. That's yeah. a subtle difference, like. Yeah, yeah, because like I said, like, with, with the DLC, there are people in the group who are vehement, you know, vehemently, vehemently, like, no, this is a bad thing, this is them wanting more money, Pokemon's becoming a three-tiered game, whatever that means, and mm. there are three-star game or something, and they're locking everything behind a paywall, they're becoming all about money, and then people are like, okay, well, look, the pure cost of producing games in the industry has skyrocketed uh, in comparison to the last two years be fair this is just how it's being done now has and then it though others, because like, like there's down it can know. be downloaded now there's like less need for physical media that's like a huge cost reduction right there and i'm not even that informed yeah. on the subject like i know that's what i'm saying like i'm uh, i'm a complete new like <laughs> i've been playing for 20 years but i'm still like i wouldn't be a, like an informed gamer at all about anything mm. but even i can see that that's not right and even if it is just the argument of look this is what they've been doing with all the third versions of the rpgs you know red and blue yellow ruby sapphire emerald even if it's just that it, it, there's still something that feels like it's it the original kind of pokemon franchise is getting further and further away from what it was originally about oh jesus sorry the seagull just crashed into the window huh <laughs> I think it's are, the, are the, have the Pokemon fight. people found you? Are they are they do they hear you complaining? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and it's one of those things where it's a bit like it's a, it's a whole kind of Pokemon thing, be it with you know, Mystery Dungeon or the new Sword and Shield game. It, it feels like you know Homer when he's got the pig flying through the air and he's chasing it and he's <laughs> like, It's just a little rusty, it's still good, it's still good. It's, it's just, just a little, little DLC, airborne. it's so good, it's it's so good. <laughs> That's literally what I feel like. I feel like I'm Homer chasing after this flying pig with Pokemon, and I'm just worried about the day when Bart comes up to me and tells me, it's over, Lisa. It's done. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's gone. Pokemon's not coming back. <laughs> All right. Well, oh. we may check back in on that DLC in a few weeks yes. if you are happy to come on the show again. But uh, Absolutely. I, what caught me off guard was you had a non-Pokemon related game they wanted to talk about the <laughs> no, show. What? Exactly. I know the, the, time, the times they are changing. Give us the rundown <laughs> on this then. This is really fun. So just in general, kind of for the podcast and just for my own kind of personal knowledge, I kind of want to expand my gaming horizons a bit. And I discovered this absolute gem of a game called Bendy and the Ink Machine. Right. Now, this is rated 12. It's for Nintendo Switch. It's by Maximum Games. <laughs> And its tagline is Fear the Machine. It's basically, as it says in the back of the box, Spendy and the Ink Machine is a first-person puzzle action horror game with a unique cartoon atmosphere and an intense, frightening storyline that keeps you guessing throughout. Henry was the lead animator at Joey Drew Studios in its 1930s payday, a studio that was best known for producing animated cartoons of their most popular and beloved character, Spendy. <laughs> okay. Many years later, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. I'm getting into this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, many years later, Henry receives a mysterious invitation from Joey Drew himself to return to the old cartoon workshop. Journey deep into the sketchy madness of this twisted cartoon nightmare. Fight the darkness. Escape the ink demon. Fear the machine. Oh, it's so weird. So... It's it's really cool. It's about like this guy who used to work in an animation studio. He's invited back years later 
it's it's filled with little the funniest little jump scares um there's it's like satan it's like mickey mouse uh, a satanic version of mickey mouse like <laughs> except with like the blair witch thrown in it's so weird like it's completely bizarre it like takes this whole kind of like you know the very original like even like itchy and scratchy would kind of take the mickey out of them like on the simpsons like steamboat itchy that kind oh, of that kind of style white. of animation yeah that exact kind, but you know, with the banjos and the fiddles and the racist magpies and all sorts of that kind of weird, just that very weird animation. The 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 main character Bendy, even on on the box, even looks like a, a bad Mickey Mouse. It's got you know those eyes that are like kind of two semicircles divided, and it's just really creepy. Or you've um got to battle like you've got to it's it's like one of those games like i suppose like i don't know resident evil or silent hill or something where you just kind of go through it and you look around for clues and things and then more things unlock as you go along but there's like these ink monsters that you have to like chop down with an axe and there's all these creepy like recordings of past employees and um, that you have to play throughout and there's projectors running throughout depicting all these like weird demonic cartoons and the soundtrack is kind of there's no soundtrack but there's occasionally music and sound effects that's really cool and it's i've just found it like i i'm really bad at stealth video games because <laughs> i'm like the least coordinated person so trying to control a left like the reason why i can't play piano my right and left hand don't work together <laughs> So I'm stuck on a part of the game that's really early on and it's really annoying and it's it, I'm only stuck in it because I am so badly coordinated because you need to trigger something in room A then run back to room B and complete a task before the trigger in room A runs out but I'm just so bad at controlling my own character I keep running into walls and stuff so that's that's just like me being awkward but it's actually just such a good game I really recommend it's so fun like I got really immersed in it and then there was this stupid little baby jump scare but because it was like four in the morning and I'm there in the dark I'm there like ah! <laughs> it literally oh it, I, it's really fun it's a so fun it'll be game. more kind of I know the kind of the art style is very appealing it's like 1930s but it's definitely more on the horror side of things like <laughs> two schools of thought on that it's described as a first person horror game but then I have some like hardcore horror gaming fans like proper gaming horror fans were like that isn't horror and I know it's not but it's scary and it's spooky and it's very fun horror and it's entirely sepia toned which is very beautiful like a, a lot of effort went into this it's absolutely gorgeous yeah. okay and like um, certainly is the first thing that springs to my well? mind Sorry, you go on there, sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say, it's only 25 quid as well. So, like, you'd probably, like, you know, fritter that away on, you know, chips or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or a takeaway or something. I know from experience, it's about the amount of one Domino's takeaway for one. Uh, yeah, so, so there you go. It's, yeah, it's certainly, it's, art style is very appealing. I'm getting Cuphead flashbacks if you've ever played mm -hmm. that. Mm, uh, yeah, but, it's, it's unique. Yeah, it's from what you tell me, it's sort of part of a movement I've seen on Steam to kind of push yeah. games back to being unforgivingly difficult, <laughs> which they aren't necessarily anymore. No, yeah, definitely. Like I said, like, and I've even watched playthroughs of the part I keep getting caught on. And I'm like, it's a bit like, you know, when uh, Ben Skinner and Chalmers keep, or no, it's like when Flanders keeps getting applause when he becomes the principal and Chalmers is like, it's just a damn popularity contest for kids. <laughs> I'm there watching the playing through going, I'm doing that. Why isn't it working? <laughs> I'm doing that exact thing. So it's literally, yeah. So it's, it's not hard, but. I'm not used to that kind of gameplay because I like the casual, lazy option of just dipping in and out of some Pokemon mm -hmm. now and again. So it's different from that. And if you were kind of, excuse me, if you were a seasoned gamer, I don't know how challenging the game controls and functions would be because I, I picked it up pretty easily. And despite my lack of coordination, I don't know how challenging or different those features would be be or if you'd be completely used to them if you were an ardent gamer but i i just think it's really fun and it's really unique and it's very strange and i've never seen um any 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 horrors anywhere games or movies or otherwise set in a cartoon uh, cartoon factory 
and I've never seen ink used as a horror medium so I just think it's really unique and it's fun it's genuinely fun even though I'm stuck on it <laughs> <laughs> all right well we have about a minute left on the clock is there anything else you'd like to recommend or just say to people on the air um I don't know um look it's the lockdown play the games uh, even even if people or saying, no, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. Play games that you love and play games that you that make you happy and just do what makes you happy and play things. And you're never too old for Pokemon. <laughs> All right, well then, I'll say something on the air, which is, if you haven't already, check out Straight Outta Canto. She's on the Nerd to Know Media uh, Facebook. You can find her through there or through her own page. And I believe you have recently started transcribing your episodes so people can read them as well, right? <laughs> kind of yeah um because straight out of canto originated as a blog post uh, well a blog in 2018 and we still do a weekly blog post but i'm just using because there's so much weird stuff like there's the what the book section there's the nostalgia nod uh there's our spooky spot there's our weird stuff where we talk about tamagotchis and rita repulses boobs and stuff like that so i'm just giving everybody uh, uh you know so you don't have to spend an hour listening to something just to hear five minutes about a tamagotchi i'm just making lots of fun blog posts from the podcast so people can get right to the chase of the weird stuff or the funny stuff or the creepy stuff <laughs> all right well then lisa thank you so much for being on the show i appreciate it, it took a while to finally sort our schedules but like thank you very much for... <laughs> <laughs> sending our love down the well you couldn't do thursday i couldn't do thursday <laughs> oh i thought you were talking about when they go back to classic crusty and it's him in suits talking to like gore vidal or something like that Oh, no, you know the episode with Timmy O'Toole and Bart down the well, and it's just this running gag of Krusty and Sting trying to organize the charity. Oh, Friday's worse than Thursday. Well. Yeah, 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 yeah. True story. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Kian. <laughs> it's been an absolute blast. And weirdly enough, I think we're about to record another segment that will go out before this. So we're in a timey wimey <laughs> tunnel. So I will see you then. You will see us in the past and we'll and the game corner will be back in just a moment. All right, so you're listening to the podcast. You're like, hey, I'm not in Ireland. How do I get in touch? Well, tune in has you covered. That's how you can check us out live when we're on the radio. Um, you go to tune in and download the app or you can check out the live streams on nairthnomedia.com or phoenix92.5 FM. If you want to get in contact with us, it's very easy. Nair to know Media everywhere. Nair to know Media on Twitter. Nair to know Media Instagram. Nair to know Media on Twitch. Nair to know Media at gmail.com if you want to reach out via email. Hope to hear from you soon. Are you a nerd? Do you like hearing about a bizarre range of topics from the world of nerd? Does your heart and hairstyle still belong in the nostalgic 90s? Are you a sucker for spooky weirdo things? Well, whether you're a hardcore nerd or a vanilla ice ice baby, Straight Outta Canto is the podcast radio show for you! Straight Outta Canto, that's K-A-N-T-O, Ireland's number one show for nerd culture, nightmares, nostalgia, and more. Straight Outta Canto. And welcome back to the Game Corner. Thank you so much to Straight Out of Canto for being on our first half. Now, if you were listening to our Nerd to Know podcast on Wednesday, you will know that my second guest today is my lovely fiance, Stevie Walls, karate instructor, cosplayer, uh, mother to Prim, all of the above. Stevie, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Excellent. So, uh, before we get into the games, like, how has kind of being stuck inside during the lockdown kind of affected your life? It's been brilliant because we have got to play all of our favourite board games, which is what we're going to talk about. Yeah, that is very, very true. And um, obviously, we've got Prim. Uh, how, do you think she's been coping okay or even noticed a difference at all? <laughs> I think when we play the longer three-hour board games, she's not as much of a fan of those. We have to plonk her in front of baby TV for those ones. Yeah, as, as she's currently. If you hear <laughs> lambs buying in the background, <laughs> that is because baby TV is currently uh, minding our child. Yeah. So, uh, well then, let's get straight into the games because we should add as a caveat... The games we tend to play are ones that can be played very quickly while she's napping. Tabletop Cork mentioned a similar uh, issue back in episode three. So, 
Stevie, what games do you have in mind to talk about today? Uh, okay, well, Sabak is the one we play when we've no time. My Hero Academia is the one we play when we've a little bit of time. And Doctor Who Day of the Daleks, which is my favorite, is the one we play when we're rolling around in time because she's decided to go for a big long nap. Yes, which we usually pay for later. Um, <laughs> yes, that's but, true. Um, okay, so I know that Dara will know what Sabacc is, but why don't you explain it to people who may not be as familiar with Star Wars stuff. What is Sabacc? Oh, Sabacc is great fun. Sabacc is a deck of cards right. and uh, a pair of die, dice, two die. Yep. And um, I would liken it to, if you've ever played uh, 21, Okay, so, you know well, where you, where you're yeah. trying to get the number twenty one. You get dealt two cards, and you and you say hit me, and they deal you more. In Sabak, you're trying to get zero. So there's red cards which are negative. There's blue or green cards. Blue or green. They're, they're blue or green yeah. cards are positive. Yeah. <laughs> and you're trying to hit on zero. What is a lovely feature is that between each round you roll the dice, and if the figures on the dice match, you throw out your cards and you get dealt new ones. So what was really nice about that one was you deal two cards yeah. and that's it. If the baby needs you, you can pack them up again. It's not a big deal. That's true. And it should be said that Sabak, for anyone who's wondering why it sounds like that, it's a Star Wars game. Oh, it is. And, it's a game uh, Lando Calrissian and Han Solo play. It's In fact, it's the reason Han won the Millennium Falcon. Exactly, yes. So, uh, But instead of dice, I think in Star Wars they have a randomizer. They press buttons and it, it so the dice recommend represents I'll that. ask Dara the next time we're on his show, <laughs> he'll know. Um, but yeah, that's basically true. And don't be intimidated by the fact that it's a Star Wars thing necessarily. Like Stevie said, it's a great fun mm -hmm. game. Very easy to pick up. It's basically 21 in reverse. And you. another feature is every round you bet on ships, right? Oh, well, we, we actually added that. Yeah, we kind of... No, no, no. Every, you're right. Every round you do bet on ships... Mm. What we did was we added a feature where you can raise, like in poker, yeah. which is great fun because if you raise it and then the dice match and your whole hand gets thrown out, it's, it just adds a nice kind of element of mystery to it. Fun. Yeah, it's an element you added that has let you win many, many games since. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. Well then, um... Do you think this is a game that people would enjoy, like, if they're familiar with card games or anything? Do you think it's kind of a steep learning curve? No, because I, I got the game for Christmas, and I insisted that my aunt and uncle and uh, a, a friend of the family mm. play, just because yeah. it was a new game and I was bursting to play. Mm. And none of them are major Star Wars fans, and they had great fun. Yeah, and it's a terrible shame, because, like, I got this for you full price in Eason's one Christmas, and... Um, since then, it's been marked down to like a fiver, like in the East Novelty, whatever. And it's a really good game. But just because it has that Star Wars logo on it, people assume it's going to be inaccessible. But it isn't really. It's great fun to pick up. Like Yeah. I mean, there's one page of instructions, if yeah. that. Yeah. And you can play around incredibly quickly. And it's not a nasty competitive game by any means. Like, it's very much down to chance. Like Yeah. So this, it's, it's, it's ideal, really. Yeah. And, uh, but before we get into any kind of further kind of Star Wars games or anything like that, like, how long have you been playing games in general? Did you kind of grow up as a board game aficionado, or is this a recent thing for you? Uh, as far back as I can remember, I remember playing cards. Okay. Uh, my grandmother was a great card player, and we all grew up playing um, a whist and uh, rummy and, and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, to, to this day, if people see me kind of shuffling in a fancy way, they're very, very impressed. But that's just because I started with cards at such a young age. Board games, I, I don't even remember board games. Even in high school, I got very into Yu-Gi-Oh card games and Pokemon card games. Board games really, it was just a classic Monopoly and, and, and uh, Scrabble until I met you. Yeah, well, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a big one. We actually have... I'm not sure if you've ever actually listened to the Nerd to Know podcast, but there's Yu-Gi-Oh! sound effects in the <laughs> intro to every episode. Uh, so, yeah, that's definitely a big, big one in this household. But you're more cards than kind of complex board games or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, and actually, speaking of card games, that's another one we play, is My Hero Academia. Yes, for, I know, probably fans of Kev's anime kind of crash course type thing will probably know what this is but in case you don't 
My Hero Academia is a Japanese anime show about a world of superheroes and these kids who go to what is effectively a superhero school. Yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. And, and then there's villains too, which is great. Yes, and it's very much sort of a superhero-oriented society, kind of a Japanese take on the Marvel-type thing. So there is a card game of it. How does that work, Stevie? Oh, well, um, each player is a teacher and you recruit students. The students have different abilities represented by numbers. Mm. So I think between the numbers one and 10 in intelligence, speed and strength. And um, you pick up the students to complete the mission. So you might have a mission that requires 30 strength, but very little intelligence, mm. in which case you want to go for the students that are stronger, not smarter, as opposed to the more academic students. But then again, you might get an academic mission. But what's nice is there's little features, like um, there's one particular teacher who, whenever they complete a mission, can bring a student back from the dead. And um, there's some students, like if you pick up Bakugo, who is, a, <laughs> he's a student, but he's always angry. If you pick him up, hmm. what is it? You can't, you can't use any special cards. Because he's a hothead and you won't listen. Yeah, yeah. Until you've, until you've got rid of him and completed a mission. Oh, that's the other thing. You get kind of cards that let you skip yeah. to the student you want or cards that lower the other person's score. And they're, they're all random. So that's great fun. You do need a little bit of space on the table because you lay out the cards, is it four by five? Something like that, yeah. yeah and yeah. they're standard card size and then you'd also need room for the cards in your hand. So you do need a, a little bit of table surface for that one. Yeah, and it's it should be stressed, it's a complicated game to explain, but it's not one to play. It's very much like you'll be dealt three missions that will require that's it, I three missions. Five, five strength, three speed, whatever. And you just have to pick up combinations of different students to beat those. Yeah. And however, whoever has the most points at the end wins. It's a very easy game to pick up. Like It is. And it's, it's what would you say? You could play a game in 20, 25 minutes? I would say so. It's funny enough because I name dropped Kev's uh, from the anime Crash Course. We played games of it on our breaks and Easons. Like, it's not a complicated well, game. All you need is the space. But then here's a bigger question then. Why do you keep coming back to it, Stevie? Um, my Hero Academia, I guess, do you know, it's one of those funny things. I actually love it because we've watched the TV series and I love the students. Yeah. And I think the powers they have really suit their personalities, but I don't think you would need to have ever seen it in order to play it. Yeah, that's true, because we've played it with kind of our cousins and that kind of thing. And they've yeah, and got you're just matching numbers, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, so you go first. I was just going to say, it's very accessible. Hmm. You know, if you want something more complicated than Sabak, mm. but not something as complicated as like a big yeah, board game, yeah. it is a it's a really lovely middle of the ground kind of game. Yeah, and it's a if you're a fan of the show, it's a very good representation of it because in the show, kids go through the school process, they get they get picked up by superhero agencies, a bit like a modeling agency or like a talent agency or whatever, yeah, and then get sent on missions to do things. So you are effectively as your player a superhero talent agent who is recruiting <laughs> students to do things. So there's, it's a fair representation of the show without being so complicated that you couldn't pick it up without having seen it. You know, do you know what else makes it fun? Mm, yeah. Is usually the winner is only by a couple of points. Oh God, yeah. Whereas, I mean, we have played games of Sabak where you like know that somebody is 25,000 ahead of you and you're not going to catch them. But uh, what's lovely about My Hero Academia is that you're so neck and neck the whole game you really don't know who's won until you're counting up the mission scores at the end and i think i think we played a game recently where uh, there was just a magic card in the last round that i think minus you two points mm. and it was the only reason i won yeah and we mostly play with two players but you could go as far as four or five players it's it's yeah, it's a very easy card game pickup. It'd be more complicated than like Sabak or something like that. It's but only... very child friendly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think you could play that with kids. I think it's plus sevens or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's I think it's teen oriented, but that's to be honest, I suspect that's more because the cards have some Japanese animation stuff, like with some anatomical things that anyone who watches anime will probably know what I'm talking about. But even that's like. <laughs> What? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, What's you know, like cards? characters who are dressed in revealing costumes, that kind of stuff. Like that's oh, like, that'd um, be as bad as it what's gets. Her name? Like, Momo. You know, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Like it's there's no. It's probably it's twelves. I think. 
but that's more because it would be more complicated than games seven year old usually play. They probably could pick it up fairly easily, but yeah, I'd say it's a very easy game to pick up, and there's a lot of replay in it because you've got five different tutors you can play as, and then they've all got their abilities. So there's a lot to come back to each and every time. Like, but if you want a more complicated game, mm-hmm. they have the Dalek. Um, listeners won't get the benefit of Stevie literally (laughs) swaying on the spot with joy. So while I go check on the baby, why don't you get us started on that? Okay, so first reason I love Day of the Daleks is it's a co-op game. So you and everybody else who's playing, you're against the Daleks, which until I played this, I didn't even know you could do that with board games. I, I thought, you know, you're always against each other. I actually love that you work as a team. So each person is a doctor. Now in the original box, which we got for my birthday, uh, you have William Hartnell, Tom Baker, um, Matt Smith and Peter Peter Capaldi. That's right. But you can get expansion packs, which of course we have got, except they haven't brought out Jodie yet or John Pertwee. Or Paul McGann. Or Paul McGann. But we have all the other expansion packs. So you pick a doctor. Um, And you have a, what they call in the game, your console. So your console, you put your doctor on one side, you put your companions on the bottom, and you put the the kind of power cards, timey-wimey cards, they're called, in the middle, which gives you powers throughout the game. Um, Your doctor will have a linked companion, so... Well, basically, whoever, if you've watched the show, it's whoever's the most important to them. Christopher Eccleston's doctor will have Rose, um, Matt Smith will have Amy Pond, Peter Polly, Clara, it's so on. You could probably, just by virtue of guessing, you'd know who the linked companion is, yeah. But you're allowed to have three companions, which means you can have fantastic games where like Matt Smith might have a a fourth Doctor companion, might have Sarah Jane with him. And they all have different strengths, so. Yeah, have you gone into the dice? No, I haven't. Could I take that? So you're a dice roll game. Yeah, yeah, you explain the dice. Yeah, so basically it's, uh, funnily enough, it's rather similar to the Hero Academia thing. Um, There, we, the game is played with dice and depending on your character's strength, they will have different dice. So there is a red dice, which would have very aggressive qualities like tactics and fighting and all that kind of stuff. There are green dice, which are a bit more energetic, like kind of running and uh, talking as well. A lot of the companions are are motor mounts, so they'd be talking ones. And there's blue dice, which are science-y. Science and kind of, what's the light bulb? Intuition? Intelligence. Yes, intelligence in general. And depending on your doctor and your characters, you will have different dice based on what they bring to the TARDIS family you're building. And then you will draw up enemies uh, who need certain traits to defeat them. So, for example, if you're fighting the very militaristic Sontarans, you'd need a lot of red. Anyone who's watched a classic show will know, say, Leela brings a lot of red. Or... If you were up against someone like the Great Intelligence, he'd be sciencey. You'd need a lot of blue. Uh, Martha Jones, Nissa, mm. anyone like that would bring a lot of blue. So, what's been your experience of learning how to play the game, Stevie? I don't remember because we learned it so long ago. I I guess because it was my first complicated game, mm. I I did find it a little bit overwhelming. I think you took the lead. Um, you have a board, and we start on Earth, and we have to get to Gallifrey. Mm. And the Dalek ship starts on Scaro, and it also has to get to Gallifrey. So mm. essentially, it's a race. And as you complete missions, you will be able to, it'll say, like, move two spaces forward mm. or move the Dalek ship three spaces forward if you lose the mission. Um, but what's fun is they have time anomalies. So if you land, there's four time anomalies, mm. I think, in a game out of, what, 20 spaces, maybe. Mm. And if you land on a time anomaly, there's, uh, like, a random element. So... What? And that random element will be based on a story in the show, like a particular Dalek adventure or something like that. Yeah, so if you pull a card, what is the card that makes all Doctors regenerate? I love that one. Uh, I don't. Uh, <laughs> the time of the Daleks. So yeah, essentially, the, like, we're kind of getting into the, the complicated details of it, but essentially the game allows you to create a Doctor Who adventure yeah. using the ingredients in the show. So you basically roll a dice... So you know if the TARDIS is working or not. If not, then you will go to a random place, like in the show. Uh, you have to take on a baddie. Uh, if you win, you will progress forward along the map, 
which looks like the kind of time vortex. And you have to outrun Davros and his Dalek ship back to Gallifrey in order to win the game. There's complicated stuff within that, but that kind of is the gist of it. And depending on what planet you land on and what baddies you face, it can get very complicated very quickly. But that's complemented by whomever your tiredest family that you assembled happens to be. Have I missed anything there? Well, there's also the little Dalek figurines. That's right, yes. You take that then. Oh, well, um, obviously if the Dalek ship beats you to Scarrow, you lose. Mm. But the other way you can lose is sometimes the penalties for failing a mission is that a Dalek will pop up on the board. And you get these gorgeous little figurines. Yeah. Of, I think it's five Daleks and Davros. Yes. And if uh, during the game all six of those figures end up on the board somewhere, mm. you also lose. Yes, Which and actually, nice that is something worth pointing out, because you do get, even in just the normal game, as it were, you do get these gorgeously made figures of yeah. the first, fourth, eleventh, and twelfth Doctors, which we had great fun painting. Yeah. I believe, was it over Christmas or during the start of the lockdown? But when it's we had Christmas. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, as we got the expansions, we were able to paint more and more of them, and that made the game... A K-9 comes in it too, actually. That's worth mentioning. So, and, so out yeah. of all the Doctors you painted, who was the hardest? We did a random element with the painting. So I got Colin Baker's Doctor, the sixth Doctor, who... Is uh, that rainbow coat? It's the rainbow coat, yes. Um, if anyone knows what his costume looks like, it's... Lorcan, how would you describe Colin Baker's costume? Neon vomish. <laughs> it's yeah, it's yellow bowling shoes, a red patchwork coat, a yellow waistcoat. He's got big yellow curly hair, like a blue belt, a cat pin. It's the person who created the costume or requested the costume wanted the worst looking coat ever. <laughs> and we've grown it's grown on us, but as a painting exercise and your first warm up to it, if you're not traditionally painting. It turned out messy, and it's taken a lot of pride for me not to go back and tweak it. I think it's lovely. Oh, well, thank you. What about you, then? What, what was the toughest one for you? Oh, I got Tom Baker. Oh, that there you go. That bleeding scarf, because I mixed up all the colours, and by the time I had painted in all the red stripes, my green had dried, and then I had to go back and remix the green, and by the time I painted all the blue had dried, and then the red had... Oh, it was just... Yeah. That scarf, it's not that it was difficult, it's that it was a long process. Because <laughs> it's a long scarf. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so I, I, I have, uh, don't have very fond memories of that. But I was most impressed with your cricket doctor. Because like his outfit is pretty much white. Yeah. But with red stripes. And you have to have the steadiest hand. It was brilliant. Yeah. And like that's like, it should be said that even though kind of we had a time painting them, the, it really, the figures were so detailed that there was a lot to paint. Like even like mm. the little details on Patrick Troughton's recorder yeah. or like, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, like David Tennant's suit. His, his, um, sonic screwdriver. That's right. Yeah, well. yeah. yeah. So it's a beautifully crafted game. And it's, it is, you yeah. can tell it's been made by people who absolutely love Doctor Who because even the powers that they've given the doctors and yeah. the companions, they just utterly suit their personalities. Yeah, like, and the companions all have abilities that are so specific to them. It could only be by someone who, like you said, really loves the show. Like, for example, Rory Pond, for lack of a better name. Like, if he gets killed, you can shuffle him back into the deck because that's his thing. Yeah, because he comes back yeah, to yeah, life. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Danny Pink, like he died saving the Earth. So if you're going to lose a mission, you can throw him under the bus to win the mission. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of like classic companion powers. like um, uh, Or like, for example, if you had someone like the Brigadier or Leela, you could automatically get an aggressive trait you're trying to look for. Yeah, you Because that's their power. It. So yeah. like, it's very well researched and optimized. And if you know it, then the details are there for you to find. Having said that, though, I'll throw a question over to you, Stevie. Compared to the Hero Academia game, would you consider it accessible to someone who, say, didn't know Doctor Who? I don't know, because mm. I know Doctor Who. Mm. And uh, I, like, I didn't come to the game not knowing Doctor yes. Who. So, yes, I, th- I think it would be if you were playing with somebody who knew Doctor Who. I think if you had two completely 
Doctor Who novices coming at the game, they mm. might struggle. Yeah. I think if you just have one person to just set the tone, you'd be all right. But just one last thing. I was going to say, I love that the game doesn't favor the modern Doctors. Yes. That it, it completely validates all Doctors, all companions, all timelines. It's 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 very honourable and well done. Yes, balanced. yes, you're right. It isn't, like, optimised towards one of them. And we've picked up the expansions because, like, you know, a good game is worth putting extra time and money into. Uh, and they've come with, subsequently, the second and sixth Doctor, Troughton and uh, Baker, the yep. other Baker. Um, Eccleston and Sylvester McCoy, who are the seventh and ninth. And Peter Davison and David Tennant, who are the fifth and tenth. And, like... It's, you're right, it's very kind of equal treatment as far as the nemeses, the companions, all that kind of stuff. You could play through the game and accidentally only kind of bump into the classic things, or you could have Tom Baker going up against the Weeping Angels. Like, it's... Yeah, that, it's, that's good. Even without the expansion things, there's a huge amount of variety to it every time you come to it, like... And then we we got so familiar with it over the lockdown that mm. we actually started playing a couple of our own rules. Yes. Um. And the, the you know it shows the game is adaptable. We we played one round where you you had to dismiss a companion every turn mm. and draw a new one. You were fine because with that one, yeah. well we we did find that we were playing it. We kind of found three companions you liked. You play the whole yeah. game out with those companions. Yeah. So this forced us to turn the companions over. So we were finding more different ones and more unusual mm. ones. And that was that was really nice. Yeah. And, um, oh, then Kian came up with a great one where we still have to go from Earth to Gallifrey, yeah. but the Dalek ship has to go from Gallifrey back to Earth. Yeah. And what's great fun then is that if there's, if your TARDIS, your little figurine of your TARDIS, hits the ship on any square, if at any point you share the same square in the game, we made that square a time anomaly. You have to sit and watch it from there. Yeah, yeah. Which, um, which worked really well because then as well as the time anomalies you know are there and therefore you can take on the missions that you know will help you jump over them, mm. you were also hitting random time anomalies. And that was a lovely feature. Yeah, and like... We've had friends over to play it. Like, we've had, I suppose, to kind of give this, this first 10 episodes of Roundness. We had Katie Riley over to play it around the time of my last birthday. And she, not knowing Doctor Who, apart from Christopher Eccleston, played with one of the older Doctors and just got it completely. There, yeah. is something to, there is something about having three or four people all working together to try and achieve this goal against the game. And there's very few board games that... Well, there's probably loads we haven't don't, don't know, but in general, it's hard to come across games like this where you aren't competing against each other. It's and first it's, time I ever. And it's it. nice to have that feature, like. Um. Do we have time to mention the Star Trek game? Uh, we've got about two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then just really quickly, um, our most recent favorite, I think, is Kean's game of Star Trek Ascendancy, mm. which is when. Uh, each person is an army. So the original box comes with Klingons, mm. Federation, and Romulans. And we bought a Borg expansion pack, as you do. Yes. Um, <laughs> so what's lovely about this game is um, it's it's the strangest thing. It doesn't have a board. It has space lanes and planets. So it kind of gets built with lines and circles. And the shape of the board ends up different each time. And you're trying to uh, explore as much as you can collect as much power as you can mm. and then uh, invade the other person or yeah or um, sometimes trade with them I prefer yeah. to invade he likes trading yeah well I'm nice <laughs> like that yeah and it's uh, it should be mentioned that both the Star Trek game the Doctor Who game uh, and we're trying to invade Stephen um, oh, sure. and uh, the Firefly game we didn't have a chance oh, to mention Firefly. That's yes a good one. Uh, they are all made by a company called Gale Force 9 who are very good at building kind of franchise-appropriate games. Like, they've also released, like, an Aliens, as in the second Alien film one, recently. And, uh, yeah, like Stevie said, it's um, it's really well built, the Star Trek Ascendancy game, because depending on which aliens you have, be they the Federation, the Andorians, the Vulcans, whomever, you will have different avenues to winning the game. If you're the Federation, you get bonuses by meeting different planets peacefully and kind of winning them over through hegemony. But if you're a Klingon, you get bonuses by destroying the other Exactly. Side, or, and you're not allowed to retreat. You just yeah. have to stand your ground till either they're destroyed or you're destroyed. Yeah. And 
incidentally, you don't have to win the game by obliterating your opponents, <laughs> though that is That's an true. option. That is you true. can become the most ascendant society. So by building up enough culture within your region, you can become the most dominant species intellectually and win the game that way. Yeah, but there's nice. Did you tell them about uh, how Q sent you across? No, nope, no, nope. go ahead. That, that was very good. Kian drew a random card. Uh, and uh, what was it? I, how did you end up on my side of the it's, board? Like he got sent completely into my territory. It yeah, great. it's I've, that should be worth mentioning. When you pick up a planet, you get a random event. That's it's, right. it's supposed to mimic what it's like when the Enterprise or whatever the Klingons equivalent to the Enterprise finds a new planet and they bump into either like a sentient species or like a worm people or like a virus or something like that. You'll get a random card and they're all based on things that have happened in Star Trek. So for example, myself and Stevie were playing Klingons against the Federation. I drew this cue card and he threw the ship that I had there halfway across the board to a Klingon planet to kind of mimic what happened when he threw a ship at the Borg or something like that, you know. But that's what's interesting about the Borg expansion pack. All the other species, as far as we can tell, they kind of work in this sort of trading, invading way. Yeah. But when you introduce the Borg to the game, it becomes more like the Doctor Who game, game yeah. in that you have to work together because the Borg are just too powerful. They build ships too fast. If you weren't working together, you'd never take them down. As we have ex as, as we yeah, did experience yeah, yeah. in the most recent <laughs> game, yes, we, we got crushed, yes. absolutely crushed, decimated, so, or yeah, assimilated more yeah. accurately. I should say there is a steep learning curve to the Star Trek one compared to the other three examples we yeah. brought up. Uh, it took me, I'm not good at board games, which I know is a shame to say, considering what the show is. He's lying. But, um, uh, but it did take me a long time of reading the instruction booklet and playing out games myself to get to grips with it and watching things on YouTube I, and all that I kind of stuff. I think even now we're still discovering things about yeah. that game. But that speaks to the amount of variety in it, which is like when you pick up an expansion back the entire way you can play the game changes. It's not just like you've gotten, you had red, blue, and yellow ships, and now you've got green ships. It is, there's a huge amount of variety in exploration, it, which I suppose is appropriate considering the huge amount of diversity and culture and all that kind of stuff within the Star Trek franchise. Which is why nerds love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or geeks love it. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to say about the Star Trek game there, Stevie? No, no, I'm good. I just wanted to uh, mention Firefly if we've got time. Yeah, I've got a minute, yeah. Yeah, okay, so Firefly board game, I warn you in advance, you need a big table. Because <laughs> um, it's a big, big board. It's, um, it's all the planets you travel yeah. around. And very similar to the other games, you, you are a captain, yep. you have a crew, that gives you the powers you need, and you have to visit planets to pick up cargo and drop cargo off but you can do it illegally which of course is more high risk because you might get caught by the police but the rewards are higher if you want to play it that way right. and you can pick up crew as you travel around pick up equipment as you travel around and and it is great fun yeah it is great fun but you uh yeah you need a big table for that one yeah and um <laughs> like more so than the other two i'd say firefly is easy to pick up and get the hang of because we haven't watched the show in a long time but like you can just it's a space pirating game. It's like, a space yeah, pirating yeah. game. Yeah. yeah. And who, who isn't going to love a space pirating game? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, before we wrap, is there anything you'd like to say on the air, Stevie? No, just that I've really, really enjoyed finally <laughs> getting on the show. Thank you, Baby TV. <laughs> Thank you, Baby TV. <laughs> and, I know, it's been lovely to talk yeah. about all the board games uh, we played during lockdown. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah and actually, this is the 10th episode, so... I'm going to take a week's break after this just to kind of let the time build up and kind of get, find a new, few new people to chat to. But before we wrap, I just want to give a shout out to the huge amount of people who've given up their time to appear on the show. Uh, very quickly, Katie Riley, uh, Oshin and Fianon Power, Oshin Wallace, uh, the wonderful shop Tabletop Gaming Cork, uh, the animator Keith Byrne, my good friend Martin Karen, uh, actors Saoirse Shanae and Rory Dunn. Uh, Luke Riley, uh, as mentioned a few times actually, Kev Coffey, uh, Ray Carney, uh, Brandon Brown, uh, Madison Bowlby, Maeve Reed, uh, Alex J. Byrne, who's only on last week, as well as Neil Cochran, Lisa, and now Stevie. Thank you so much for giving up your time for this. This has been 
a great 10 episodes and I'm really looking forward to the next one. Right. Excellent. <laughs> so, uh, with all that said, as I said, we'll be taking next week off. If you want to appear on the show, reach out to us through either the Game Corner's Facebook page or Instagram or indeed just through Nerd to Know Media. We want to hear from lots of different people. So don't be afraid if you haven't been on a podcast before. So, with all that said, I've been Keanu Calicorn. Oh, I've been Stevie. And this <laughs> has been The Game Corner. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to a Nerd to Know Media production. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. 